Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Ryan Getz. Remember, new shows are posted every Monday and Thursday. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show, CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on our website. Today, I spoke with the principal at Pross Capital Management, Ryan Getz. Ryan fell in love with trading in college. He got off to a great start and then blew all of his gains. This taught Ryan a lesson. Trading wasn't going to be as easy as he thought it would be. So out of college, he got a full-time job and committed himself to learning how to trade while he was working. Ryan spent many years learning how to trade while he had a full-time job. And in 2017, he was able to leave his full-time job and become a full-time trader. Ryan shares with us his journey in becoming a full-time trader. We talked about his process for trading and building an automated strategy, how he sizes his positions, what his edge is in trading, and more. Without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Ryan. So Ryan, I was reading about you and I saw that you started trading stocks in college. And I'm um, Pretty sure that's probably how you got hooked on trading. So, so talk to us a little bit about your journey to becoming a full-time trader. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Anthony. Um, yeah, I mean, th th that's right. You know, I, I kind of um, really, you know, my father introduced me to the stock market when I was um, in high school, my, my senior year of high school. And then um, really, as I transitioned into college, I you know, started um, learning more about stocks and and, and trading stocks and, and, and really just um, was absolutely hooked um, as I um, kind of went through that process. And, and so, you know, I, I, I traded throughout most of college um, at first, you know, really just buying stocks based on fundamental analysis. And kind of as time progressed, I started adding in some technical factors uh, as well. And, you know, by my last year of college, I mean, I was trading everything from um, options to, to futures to to spot currencies and um, you know and and I'm sure we'll come back to this but I mean I, I was trading everything under the sun and, and just but really had no system in place um, and you know I ended up getting you know my last year of college was in 2008 uh, in 2009 and I'm getting lucky. Um, I, I owned a bunch of long call options on uh, some different stocks in March 2009, and that was, you know, right when we were coming out of the financial crisis. And and as the market started to rally um, after March 2009, I did pretty well uh, with those call options. And you know, I, I, I joke now looking back on that, but you know, that was probably the the worst um, experience um, it, for, for me um, in my in my trading career. You know, it seemed great at the time, but um, you know, at that point, my confidence just got sky high. Um, you know, thought that it was only a, a matter of time before I was going to be just making um, tons of money in, in the stock market. And um, over the next couple of years, I proceeded to lose basically everything I'd made um, that year as um, on those options um, coming out of the financial crisis. So, you know, kind of two years after that, I, I, I decided to, um, you know, at that point that I didn't really know what I was doing trading, um, having lost all that money. And I decided to take a break uh, at that point um, and really uh, focus on my career in finance uh, that I had at that time. So, 
you know, after taking a break for uh, a, a couple of years um, from, from trading, um, you know, it's still, I, I still had a passion for trading. Um, and, and, and so I continued to, to read, you know, about the stock market and about trading kind of as I was taking that break. And, and during that time, I came across um, the uh, quantitative and, and algorithmic uh, trading strategies. And, and um, that's what I kind of became interested in and, um, you know, really, really was attracted to that because um, I knew that I needed to have some kind of system in place. Um, and so that's really kind of where I, I my, my focus um, um, really honed in my focus on on that type of trading, and um, you know proceeded in in, in that direction, um, and that, that kind of you know a little bit brings me to kind of where I am today and and how I've how I'm currently trading. Yeah, after reading your story and hearing you talk about your journey today, the one thing that keeps coming to mind is you've got grit. And as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to make it in this business, you have to have grit. You grinded it out when times got tough. And you did what I think a uh, few people would do is step back, say, you know what? I'm going to have to get a full-time job. I'm going to have to learn while I'm working. And I, my guess is that there's a lot of people out there listening to this show right now that have full-time jobs that want to be in your position where they could leave their job and become a full-time trader. You've been able to do that. Talk to us about how you balance your time between working your full-time job and learning how to become a trader. Yeah, so um, I have kind of become um, an early riser since I uh, graduated from college and, and started working full-time. And so, you know, typically I would get up, uh, you know, but uh, between four, five in the morning, um, you know, most of the time, you know, usually I had my alarm set for four thirty in the morning, and, and I would get up and and work or do research, um, you know, code. I, you know, I had to teach. I, I don't have a programming background, and so I had to teach myself how to code um, at that same time as well. And so I would teach myself to code, um, look at, you know, research different trading strategies, and I would. Typically do that uh, up until the, up until I left to go to work in the morning, and then you know oftentimes spend uh, some hours in the evening as well. But you know I, I, I tried to be you know pretty consistent. I also have a family, and so um, you know I, I tried to usually spend evenings with my with my wife and and, and now my you know couple of kids that I have. But um, you know tried to be really consistent, and, and I, I think that that's key. With a lot of areas of trading, but but that consistency that I had of getting up every morning and and, and working, I, I think that really helped me uh, develop my strategy uh, over the course of a couple of years. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, until you have a consistent process in place, you're never going to find the results that you're looking for as a trader. Now, now something I'm curious about is how you knew what to even look for or decide what to start programming when starting to build an automated strategy. I mean, I look back at my career, I, I traded for 10 years before I even considered automation because I wouldn't have known at the beginning of my career even what to, what to test or what to program. I was looking at so many different things. I mean, everything, when you look at it, looks like it could work but very few things do work. <laughs> so for a new guy like you who didn't have a ton of experience, where did you even begin? How did you know what to look for when beginning to program an automated strategy? Yeah, I mean, great question. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it was a bit of a, a trial and error process at, at first, for sure. I mean, I, I'd been, you know, just because I'd been so interested in, in, in the financial markets, I'd been following uh, the financial market since, you know, my, my senior year of high school. And so, um, you know, I, I, I feel like I already had a good fundamental understanding of different trading strategies and, and um, a, a, a good fundamental perspective on the market. But, you know, um, there's, it, it is, it's something else entirely to uh, develop an, an automated trading strategy. And there's, there's so many different 
the different components that go into that. And, you know, one of the hardest things is developing a strategy that, um, that, that you back test that that's going to translate to, uh, performing well during live trading. And, and, and that is, will trip a lot of people up. And, you know, that, that process just took me some time, uh, and, and, you know, I would develop strategies, um, you know, back test those and then, and then see how those performed, um, you know, in, in live trading and more of a, you know, ongoing, uh, simulation type trading and, and, and then also, you know, live trading as well and, and, and making sure that, um, you know, executions in live trading were in line with, with what they were in my back test. And so, I mean, that I could talk, you know, for hours about, um, that process and, and, and different things that I've done, um, or developed over the years to make sure that, you know, back tests are, are in line with, um, you know, uh, live trading. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's overall, I think the main thing is that it's, it, it was just kind of a, um, a, a process for me that I, I, you know, just had to learn over time as I developed these strategies, kind of what worked, what didn't work, how, how to, how to tell that once I back test a strategy, um, how to get a good sense for whether that, that strategy will work going forward. And, and, you know, I, I feel like one of the main things for me is that it has to have some kind of fundamental, uh, market principle that, that is explainable. That's, that's simple and explainable, um, because you can get into, um, the pitfall of, of overfitting, uh, based on past data and, and, and really, um, you know, just your, your, your back test is not going to translate to, to live trading. Um, if you're just trying to, to fit to your past data. And so I think having some kind of fundamental, um, economic principle, um, is, is key when you're designing strategies, um, because, uh, you know, what I've found is that those have the best chance of, of working uh, going forward in live trading. All right, let's just start with one strategy that you've developed. Take us through your process from beginning to end in developing that strategy. Sure. Well, so I, I think, you know, probably one of the easiest strategies to um, understand and, and kind of um, will you know, communicate some of this um, kind of the, the fundamental you know, market principles that I'm, um, you know, that I think are important to have is, is you know, I use a lot of uh, volume profile and I think that there's uh, some good information when you're looking at, at volume profile in terms of um, identifying supply and demand points. And, and I think, you know, when we're talking about fundamental market principles, I think supply and demand is something that we see in the market. It's known in any, you know, not just in the financial markets, you know, any market when you're buying and selling a product, supply and demand, we know that has a, that, that impacts the price. And so using market profile to, um, identify different areas of where there's supply and demand in the market um, is I, is um, is an integral part of, of one of my strategies, and I will um, combine that with some other technical indicators. So all of my strategies use purely technical indicators, um, uh, technical indicators on price and volume as inputs, and so. I, I will use um, the, the volume profile um, to identify areas of supply and demand. And then also I want to make sure that I'm, I'm trading with the longer term trend um, that's, uh, that's apparent in the market. And so I will use um, this particular strategy uses um, the ADX indicator uh, uh, as well as the RSI and I will use both of those indicators to make sure that I'm, I'm trading in the direction of whatever the underlying trend is. And as I'm developing strategies, um, when we, when we start to, you asked a question about, uh, what markets I'm, I'm trading. And so I like to, right now I trade 15 different futures markets. Uh, I run the exact same strategies across all of those different markets. Um, and so that's everything from uh, uh, equity indices to financials to uh, energies 
um, metals and currencies. And so futures contracts on all of those uh, different markets. And when I'm developing a strategy, I, I'm, I'm primarily looking for a strategy that is robust and something that is that that is going to work across all those different markets that is going to work across different time frames and different parameter sets. Um, and so, you know, so, some of the best advice that, that I've heard when I first started developing automated trading strategies is that you're not trying to develop the strategy that looks best in your back test. You're trying to um, develop a strategy that is robust and that is going to work going forward. And that, that probably means that there's strategies that are going to look better when you back test them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best strategy to use going forward. And so I'm typically looking for something that, you know, when I change and, and look at, you know, different parameters for all these technical indicators that I use, um, you know, when I look at different parameters for the RSI, for the ADX, for my volume profile, when I, you know, look at, um, you know, different ranges of support and resistance, um, you know, I, I'm looking for uh, a strategy where I can alter all of those parameters um, within a pretty wide range and, and still get pretty consistent results. And so I think that's you know, one of the main things that for, for new traders that are uh, developing automated trading strategies is that you really want to focus on developing a strategy that is robust, um, not just something that looks best um, in, in your back test. Okay, a couple of things I want to talk about. Uh, first, I, I don't want to say I was surprised, but I kind of was when you said that you only developed one strategy for all the different markets that you were trading. And the, the reason why I say I was surprised was because for me, I only trade two different markets primarily. Uh, I trade more than that, but primarily two. And for those two markets, I use the same strategy, but my approach is different because I think that they're, they're different animals. I mean, I trade the S&P and I trade the 10-year. I can't execute both of them the same. I've had to develop a relationship with them. And for me, if I traded both exactly the same, I, I feel like my results wouldn't be as good. So I'm wondering why you felt that you only needed one strategy and that it would work equally as well on all of the different markets that you're trading. Sure. Yeah. So, so for me, it just, it goes back to the concept of, of robustness and, you know, the, the optimal, you know, when I back test a strategy, sure. There, there's an optimal point where you say this strategy works best on, crude oil. And so I should only trade it on crude oil. Um, the, the problem for me with that is, you know, the markets are constantly changing and you, you know, you can look back, I can look back at my um, results historically and see when that just as different thing dynamics change across markets globally. You can see certain markets um, going in and out of sync with um, with my strategy, and so as long as you know, if I have a strategy that I've back tested, um, you know, I need that strategy to to show a profitable back test. Well, and and, and not just a, a profitable back test, but also a back test that that with a, a good um, risk to reward metrics, right? Um, and so. It needs to have uh, good performance metrics across those 15 markets that I trade, um, and then and, and, and that gives me confidence that okay, I don't know that this strategy is going to uh, be profitable in every single market going forward when I start trading this live, but I think that it will be profitable in the majority of the markets that I trade, and that gives me good diversification from an overall portfolio standpoint that. You know, as one market um, works better with my strategy at, at one point in time, like that's probably going to change over time and, and, and different markets are, are going to work better um, with the strategy. And so, um, yeah. And so, I, I, I again, it, it goes back to my point of robustness of developing a strategy that 
that I think will work consistently in the future, not just optimizing to a single market based on um, based on past history. And so, you know, and so so ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm trying to develop these broad strategies that um, are, are, are simple, that are based on fundamental market principles that I think are relevant across every single market that, that someone can trade. And, and then I'm going to run those strategies across every single market um, because I feel like that gives me the best chance of being profitable from a portfolio standpoint um, in the future. Okay, yeah, very valid points as to why you uh, chose to go that route. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was position sizing. But a uh, quick question before we talk about that is, do you use any fundamental analysis or is it just purely technical analysis in your strategies? No, no fundamental research. None. Okay, then now the reason why I asked the fundamental analysis question first was because Let's face it, in this day and age, uh, these macro themes and Twitter headlines, just they move the market so much that even though I'm a day trader, I have to keep an eye on these things. And you know, obviously with what's been happening with the Fed, central banks over the past, gosh, many years now, I feel it's extremely important for me as a trader to understand those themes that are happening in the market. Is the Fed raising rates? Okay, I'm going to trade my treasuries a little bit more aggressively on the sell side. Is the Fed cutting rates or you know doing QE? Okay, well, I'm going to trade treasuries a little bit more aggressive on the buy side. And, and I just watch to see how my strategy reacts to the fun, these fundamental themes that are going on in the back, background. And it gives me... I don't want to say it's a it's a bias, but it, it is a bias of direction when it comes to my technicals working with fundamentals. So I'll trade more aggressively on one side versus the other, right? Now with the S and P, it doesn't matter as much, but with the Treasury market, it, it definitely matters to me. So I'm curious: Are you ever? Do you ever have a bias more to one side versus the other? Um, I know you talked about looking at primary trends, so I think that that maybe uh, is one way that you're looking at it, at it. And when it comes to position sizing, are you always trading the same contract size, or do your position sizes vary? Yep. No. Uh, good question. Um, you know, I am. I, I'm never biased in, in in one direction or another. Um, you know, my my technical analysis will obviously help helps me to try to get on the right side of the market um, from a, you know, kind of a longer term trend perspective. And so, you know, all of my trading is is on an intraday basis. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very much less concerned with longer term fundamentals as long as I'm trading in the direction of the trend over, you know, the last two to three days um, and uh, then, then I'm not concerned about uh, longer the longer term fundamental picture. Um, now, you know, I, I, all of my, posi my my position sizing changes based on market volatility. Um, so, you know, in, in that sense, you know, depending on uh, you know more volatile markets will cause me to have smaller position sizing. Um, but you know, in terms of what you're talking about with um, having a, a long or short bias um, or, or, or having larger position sizes based on some um, long or short bias. I, I don't do that. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm wanting to play out the, the statistics, right? And, and I know that, um, you know, if I take similar position sizes, um, you know, adjusting, only adjusting for volatility, just because I want to have smaller position sizes if there's more volatility in the market. But um, outside of that adjustment, you know, I want to take consistent position sizes because I want to give uh, the, the chance for the statistics to play out over time. And, you know, I feel like if I'm constantly adjusting uh, my position sizes based on um, so, some other factor, 
then I, I'm not really letting those statistics play out over time of, of all the research that I did based on uh, the strategy's historical performance. So what is it about your strategy that you feel gives you an edge? Sure. So I think the primary thing that uh, gives me an edge is my ability to code my strategies and, and also the, the fact that I, um, I've been watching the markets um, for you know, a, a long time now. And I feel like I, I understand um, some of the fundamental drivers and in, in, in the way markets work. And so, you know, I, I, I for the majority of and, and definitely not saying that um, every firm is like this, but, you know, I, I, a lot of the, the firms and, and people that I know that, that work for um, quantitative type um, uh, trading firms, there, there's really this disconnect between the people who are developing the trading strategies um, who are generating the, the trading ideas and then the, the individuals that are that are responsible for coding those and, and putting those into um, um, uh, an automated strategy. And so, um, you know, my, my ability to um, look at the markets to come up with a uh, trading idea, a, a strategy idea, and then implement that into code um, I feel like really gives me an edge in the market because I feel like for me, that's a pretty seamless process. And I can go from, you know, you know, idea generation to strategy deployment in a relatively short period of time. Um, because I understand, you know, I'm, I'm doing, I'm working through that entire process. Um, you know, I understand I'm, I'm directly coding all of it. And so, you know, I understand exactly what to look for. Um, as I'm as I'm coding it, and then when I'm testing that, I, I, I'm I know what to look for in terms of errors um, in that code, or um, you know things like that 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 might um, you know, cause the the strategy to to falter in the future. And so um, I think that kind of seamless process of um, of developing a, a trading strategy really gives me an edge. I know you said that you trade 15 futures markets, so I hate to put you on the spot here, but uh, can you name all of the 15 markets that you're trading? Sure. Yeah, I, I'm sure I may um, end up missing one here, but um, so I, I trade the um, Australian dollar, the British pound, the Canadian dollar, um, the uh, Japanese yen, the euro, and I've got uh, crude oil, gold, um, silver, copper, natural gas. Um, the uh, NASDAQ, Dow, E-mini, S&P, and then the 30-year and 10-year uh, treasuries. So why did you ultimately choose those 15 markets to trade your strategy on? Why not different ones? Why not more than 15? Yeah, so ultimately it goes um, into um, some more of the, the specifics of my strategy and um when those markets are trading and and so ultimately without you know spending uh, just a ton of time on this kind of from a high level um, you know those are what i would consider some of the generally most liquid futures markets and so i i, I like um, that they have a a, a a relatively large average daily volume um, they're liquid products they, they also trade generally, um, you know, almost 24 hours a day for the most part. And so um, from, from a high level, most of my strategies are looking at um, predicting kind of where the market is going to be trading um, in the um, d during the morning trading session of the U.S. market. So, you know, call it 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. Central Time. And so and, and so I'm, I'm basing that as I you know, was kind of describing that my strategy earlier where I'm using uh, volume profile. Um, you know, I'm, I'm using volume profile as well as some other technical indicators based on the, the previous day to say, okay, here's um, the price and volume that we had uh, the previous trading session. As a result of that, I think the, the market's going to be trading in this range uh, tomorrow morning. And so I will look at my, my strategy, will look at scaling in, getting into a trade, um, during the uh, night session. So, you know, generally from like tw 12 a.m. 
to about 6 a.m. in the morning is when my entries are occurring. And so um, and so with those markets, you know, I, I, I can get into those trades kind of overnight and um, look to take advantage of where I think the market's going to be trading that next morning. And th those markets allow me to do that with the, the trading hours. There's other futures markets um, that that that, you know, don't have the volume um, overnight or, or aren't open um, during uh, the, the, the night um, session and that um, don't allow me to run similar strategies. Gotcha. I want to talk about your latest move, becoming a CTA. We talked about your journey and, and how you work so hard to become a successful independent trader. And now you've moved on uh, from trading just for yourself to becoming a CTA. Why'd you make this move? Well, so, you know, as I, um, so I left my full-time job back in April of, of 2017, uh, to become an independent trader. And as time progressed, I, um, started, I got some interest from some people that were, um, interested in, in, in investing, um, alongside me. Um, you know, that I'd shown some pretty consistent profitability and, and so, you know, the, the fact that I, I had some people that, that were interested in investing and then, um, you know, just the, the obvious fact of being able to also draw a, a management and incentive fee um, as people invested alongside me off the, the money that I was managing, um, that, that was also attractive to me. And, and you know, at, at the end of the day, I kind of looked at, as I, I thought through the process and, and, and looked at what would be required to set up a uh, CTA trading program and the cost wasn't all that prohibitive of getting set up as a CTA. There's, you know, without going into too many details, typically a, a CTA manages uh, separately managed accounts. And so you're not pooling investor money. Each investor has an account, um, a separate account, and they have uh, control over that account and um, you're not pooling investor funds. And and, and because of that, uh, it can be uh, less cost prohibitive to, to be set up as a CTA under that structure than, than as a hedge fund or something like that where you're pooling investor assets. And so it was, it was, an, it was attractive from a uh, cost standpoint. And, and so I kind of just looked at it and said, OK, you know, I'm, I'm trading my, my own money today. You know, I can continue to trade my own money. This setting up the CTA program will also give me the ability to allow other uh, people to invest alongside me um, as I continue to trade my strategies. And so I, I didn't feel like there was, um, it was going to change in, in a lot of regards. My, my trading was going to remain the same. And particularly since it's from a, an, an automated standpoint, you know, it can be emotionally, it can be a huge change uh, trading other people's money, investor money. And, um, you know, I, I, I've definitely felt that uh, emotional uh, response a little bit as I, I start to add clients. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm running my strategies. Um, you know, I don't ever, um, you know, override my strategy signals. I, those, everything trades on an automated basis and, and I don't ever override those. And so, um, and so I feel like that makes it a little easier for me and in the transition a little easier, um, uh, you know, as, as I'm trading investor money um, that I just continue to let my strategies run as they have always run. Like I said from the beginning, I love the grit, love the ambition. Great insights so far today, but we're not done yet. I have rapid fire questions next if you're ready for those. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm ready, Anthony. All right, everybody, our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Access the global markets from virtually anywhere with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. And now you can trade cryptocurrency spot and derivative markets side by side. For more information, please visit tradingtechnologies.com. Ryan, first question for you What trader has influenced your life the most and why? For me, it's difficult to, to have identify one in particular. I've, I've been influenced by uh, uh, many different traders and have taken um, small pieces from, from a bunch of different people. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome in trading? 
uh, the success that I had in, early on in college um, and, and the overconfidence that I developed as a result of that. How has your trading process evolved over the years? Um, you know, one from really that being 100% discretionary in college to um, 100% systematic today. What is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? Patience. What's your favorite book about trading? Uh, Market Wizards. Favorite movie about trading? The Big Short. Best piece of advice you've received about trading? Don't focus on your next trade. Focus on your next 1,000 trades. Uh, it's all about compounding wins over a very long period of time. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would it be? Identify your edge and be specific. Um, you know, figure out what you do better than 90% of other traders. And if you can't answer that question, you don't have any business trading. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge in trading, what would you say? Um, it's a seamless process in developing strategies from idea generation to coding those strategies and deploying those live. Last question for today, Ryan, what's your favorite thing to do when you're not trading? I like spending time with my wife and two little girls. Awesome. Ryan, where can people find you on social media, preferably Twitter and give us a website to check out. Yeah, so I actually don't have a Twitter handle, um, but my website is crosscapital.com, P-R-A-U-S. Come on, man. We got to get you on Twitter. <laughs> it's where it's at, man. <laughs> I, I know. I know. I, I've resisted. I, I've, I've thought about it a, a few times, but um, yeah, I haven't, haven't made the plunge. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I need to do that. Ryan, thank you again for coming on Futures Radio Show today. Thanks, Anthony. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.